I have with me today a naturopathic doctor, certified yoga instructor, and founder of Peace of Mind Method, Dr. Jenna Tabachnik. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I know that you work with high achievers who struggle, struggle silently with uh, anxiety and depression. How did you find yourself on this path? Why did this become your mission? Um, I specifically wanted to work with people in this bracket because that is what I struggled with personally myself. Um, I found that there wasn't a lot of support for people who weren't obviously showing with signs and symptoms of anxiety um, or people who kind of didn't fit the mold of right. what it's supposed to look like. Yeah. Um, and then we would go to the doctors and be like, hey, this is what's going on. They'd be like, oh, you're fine. You know, you got a job and you have a spouse and you have a kid and everything is great and you you have your stuff together. So there's nothing we can do for you. Um, and I really found my groove in that niche um, because there's so many of us that are actually struggling. Um, and it's silent because we feel like it's not, we're not sick enough to go out to reach out and get help. But I feel like all of that's changing right now. Um, and that's why I love doing what I do, because I get to now make that silent area very loud um, and very accepted. So that's how I came to be what I am. So in other words, this is not just a calling for you, but it's actually a personal journey. Um, yes. And as part of this personal journey, I know you work with a number of people. Do you find any of their experiences, things that they speak about, things that they bring up? relate to your own personal experience and then you have discoveries of your own like you probably don't do it with them and go whoa that's something i'm thinking about it's more of an aftershock effect where you sit and reflect on the conversation and think that's actually something i can relate to and i can sort of dig into and, and get myself wrapped around yeah so i would say being on my own journey um that kind of took its place and its role before I ever felt comfortable working with people in that space. Okay. Um, so there's never really a time where I'm being caught off guard where I'm like, wow, I haven't worked through that. Or, you know, that's something for me to self-reflect on because I have done the work prior to being in that space comfortably with someone. Right. But that doesn't mean that I'm never seeing myself in someone else or getting activated on the spot and then having to work through whatever's coming up within myself. Uh, because there is something to be said about transference and counter transference with doctor and patient and needing to hold your space very strongly so that you are not having a bias in an appointment or when you are providing a treatment plan. Um, so I am very careful about how I navigate that with myself. Um, and I don't think any of it would actually be possible if I didn't do the self work on myself before presenting myself in front of my patients. Um, so I'm very big on walking the walk and not just talking the talk. And I think that that comes through very strongly with my patients, um, with the authenticity that we get to create between each other. I know you're a proponent of discourse. Do you ever <laughs> find yourself in a, in a situation where with a client, you're in an, a sort of an adversarial state with them because either they're in a mindset of, I don't really want to deal with this situation and you're of a mindset of, but we have to walk through. I mean, you have to get yourself there. Yeah, yeah. all the time. <laughs> um, and that can only be really navigated well when you have a very strong doctor patient relationship, like that therapeutic bond has to be there. And that's something that I work very strongly on with my patients, um, as well as leading with honesty and being like, hey, we're going to get into arguments. And it's not me against you. It's we're both in the ring together and how to look at these things as symptoms of whatever we're going through mental health wise. And how do we be there together and navigate the symptoms as opposed to me being the enemy? Um, and I think that when my patients already hear that from the beginning, they're like, OK, we're going to fight. But when we fight, it's not really a fight. It's an opportunity for growth. And what I tell my patients is, is the doctor patient relationship is the playground right? You're going to feel things. You're going to feel frustration. You're going to feel, you're going to feel aggravated. You're going to want to tell me to shut up. Um, there's all these things that are going to happen. Um, and when you expect it, when it presents itself, I get to say to my patients, Hey, do you see what's happening right now? And then they go, yeah. And then I'm like, okay, let's navigate through that because that's more fun than being at odds with the person who's supposed to be in there intimately helping you with what you're working through. Right. Um, so that is definitely how I address things. Um, there, it's never an argument. It's all about curiosity and fun. And I think that my patients, maybe it's the way that I carry myself in appointments, but they always know that everything is fair ground. We can bring up anything, talk about anything. And meeting a patient where they're at is the most important thing. And I know we talked about this on our previous call, so I will just throw that word out there right now. Um, but 
positive manipulation is what I tell my patients we are always working toward uh, so that we can take ourselves and shape shift in the best way possible instead of having the negative connotation of what manipulation usually means. Um, And I want to be able to bring my patients into that space where they go, I don't want to deal with this. And I don't want to talk about it and I don't want to address it, but I also recognize that my resistance to doing that thing is what's required right now. Um, and we do that discomfort thing together. Right. So, so I believe yeah. the term what, that you had used was cognitive manipulation. And now it's, it's positive cognitive manipulation because I was going to bring up cognitive man- manipulation and how you would introduce that with your um, with your clients, because right off the bat i'm sure there's a number of them that hear that and think wait you're not brainwashing me what are you talking about and i would assume that you start off with that intro of here's how we do things and you'll feel like this but it's so that you get a better way of thinking through things this is not just me telling you it's you actually doing it yourself right yeah right am i doing it to you right now Thank you for pointing that out. I'm just just trying it out. Um, The other thing that you had mentioned, and I really like the term, and I know I'm going to get bleeped for it, is (laughs) it with your own shit. Okay, so I mean, I I, that is a term for me. That is a, a phrase for me that really resonates because there are times when you don't want to. When you're sitting, I don't want to. I just don't. I want to sit and I want to. eh but you drag it out. You say, no, no, sit in it, sit in it so that you're aware of it, as opposed to putting it in the bookcase, you know, and sitting in the quiet zone and thinking, oh, it'll take care of itself. It'll just get buried. And the more things that are in the bookcase, you don't want to open the bookcase anymore. So yeah, sit with your shit is the hallmark of everything I've ever worked on with my patients. Like when I built peace of mind method of how I work with my high achievers, the motto of it, is you're going to have to learn how to sit with your shit. Um, Because what we do, I mean, this applies for everyone that has mental health struggles and probably people in general. But what I notice specifically with my high achiever, high functioning, like perfectionist type of people is we don't want to look at the things that make us uncomfortable. And we are professional swervers. We're like, oh, I can deal with that later. Oh, I don't really feel like talking about that right now. Or I don't want to go there because it doesn't feel safe for me. But I'm going to find every other thing that I can put in the way of being busy or doing things so that we don't have to feel discomfort. And that's where sit with your shit was born from, um, because we are always running away. And I wanted to give everyone a motto that they could come back to and ask themselves, Am I sitting in my shit right now or am I evading myself? And that is probably the biggest plight of being a human being that I see in practice. And that's why I'm constantly turning people back to themselves and saying, look in the mirror, watch what you're doing, watch what your patterns are doing, listen to what your mind is saying, even if it's uncomfortable and you want to run, observe the fact that you want to run, observe the fact that you're trying to put something else in place to cope and make you feel better instead of just being with yourself. Um, Because I find that a lot of the time when my patients and myself and everyone I interface with, if they're not comfortable being with themselves, that's always going to lend towards symptoms of anxiety and depression, whether you like it or not. And you can hide it or you can wear it like a little t-shirt or a sticker on your forehead. But like, if you're not able to do that, then we're always going to end up there. Whether that's After 20 years of living or 40 years of living or 60 years of living, we all have a different tolerance level. And eventually, if you don't feel comfortable inside your own skin and know how to sit with your stink, then we're always going to end up in a little bit of an uh uh-oh zone. And that's why it's the first skill and the first tool that I work on with my patients. And that is usually with meditation which is why it's so perfect to say sit with your shit because I force them to sit with it. Um, and and everything kind of comes to light and you don't, you don't get to escape yourself anymore. And I think that that is the perfect example of what it's like working with me is you have the choice to either lean in or get out. It's a, it's a, I'm going to get bleeped again. It's a shit or get off the pot situation <laughs> because <laughs> I'm going to, no matter what, when people are working with me, force themselves to see themselves and what they see isn't there's no judgment and that's a huge thing that i have with my patients too it's whatever comes up if you think it's bad i don't it's all neutral to me i'm willing to talk about anything we can unpack whatever you want you can tell me all the crazy things you think about yourself and nothing is bad and that is what it means to really sit 
in that shit and saying, okay, I'm going to be with myself right now instead of judging everything that I am um, and falling into my behavioral cycles that are causing issues down the line. So would you say that part of the reason people don't sit um, is societal norms, where society says you're supposed to be a certain way, and especially high achievers who put the bar ever so fractionally higher than most most of us normal human beings to be 100% there. I mean, athletes, I'm sure you must deal with a few of those uh, yes. in, in your work because they are, I'm 100% on. What I do say to my people who are stuck in that belief, right? You're calling it societal. Let's also say societal um, plus childhood experiences that lend us to where we end up, right? These all create belief systems within us. Because even if society was saying, oh, you know, you got to find balance and chill and relax more, which people do. People say that all the time. That specific person who's the high achiever hears that and they go, huh? No, how? Not possible. Not doing it. Um, so that it, it is societal, but it also really is inbred into us as we're growing up and how we interface with ourselves and how we deal with discomfort. So a lot of my high achieving people, and let's put athletes in that same pot, is they don't like the feeling of non-success. They don't like the feeling of ease. They love the feeling of chaos. They love the competition. They love the proving of the self-worth. And they are fed by the fire of all the negative beliefs that they have in their head about themselves. No one's really pushing them. Right? It's themselves that's getting them to where they need to be. And that's why they've ended up in the situation in the first place. No one can force anyone to do anything. But yes, oh. I do. The percent of the people really? that I talk to do that. <laughs> and that's why I never, when I work with people, and obviously I'm an online doctor and I have my community. Um, so a lot of people are reaching out to me in a very casual way. Um, people engage with a lot of my free content. So they are absorbing and listening and understanding everything without taking action. And that is the the line that's drawn in the sand between people who learn how to cope with their mental health and people who don't, is those that are willing to potentially set themselves up for failure, but possibly success. Those that are willing to take action. Um, most people that I interface with tell me that they're struggling. And tell me that they want to do something about it and never move into action. <laughs> and it, it's crazy to me because I hear that and I go, that makes no sense. It's like someone saying, I want to learn how to do a push up. And you go, okay, so how many times are you going to the gym and lifting weights and getting down on the floor and doing it? And they're like, none, but I really want to do a push up. And you're like, that makes no sense. Or <laughs> someone who says, I want to lose weight. And you're like, okay, what is the plan in place to do this? And they're like, I don't know. I just keep trying and it's not working, but I keep weighing myself and the weight's not going anywhere. And I go, that makes no sense. We have to have a plan. And mental health is this invisible thing in the room that people don't understand that you have to have a tangible plan and you have to hold yourself accountable to things and you have to have ways to clinically judge a success versus a failure. There does have to be sometimes third party support to give you that insight. Um, and I think people struggle with the, well, it's in my head, so it's my problem. And I'm going to think my way around this instead of doing my way into this. Um, and I want everyone, whoever's listening to this, to walk away with the concept that mental health is not different than your physical health. And you have to have a concrete plan in place that you can shift and fix depending on what's coming up in your life and in your body. And that is something that I'm very confident about. And that's why I built Peace of Mind Method so that every single one of my patients has a way in which they do things for themselves so that they see results and see shifts and changes. And then six months later, when a symptom starts coming back, like heart palpitations or poor sleep or trouble breathing or whatever it is that someone is tends to complain about with anxiety, let's say, that they can go back to their plan and say, hmm, what do I need to tighten up over here? What's been slacking? What do I need to do more of? What do I have to do less of? And it has to be this physical dance. It can't just be, well, I'm thinking myself through it so I can make myself better because you you cannot do that. I wish I could have like a diagram on a whiteboard here of showing everyone the connections between the body and the mind and the nervous system and explaining how sometimes we have to step back from what we think is working because it's not working at all. And we have to revamp the situation and say, okay, I'm going to just do a cleanup, a cleanup of all the things and make sure that I haven't missed any of these things, turn over all the rocks, look in all the corners and say, is my lifestyle 
matching what I want my mental health to feel like and be like? Or am I sitting here and complaining and being upset about all the physical and the mental experiences I'm having, but not doing anything about it? Right. So would you say that that's a sort of a... Um on the negative side, negative neuroplasticity. So if a person is thinking themselves, oh, I can fix this, what they're doing is just simply rewiring their brain to make it feel like they're doing something, even though what they're doing is making it worse by doing that. They're giving themselves that thumbs up bonus points feeling by avoidance. So it's you're talking about avoid, avoid. I'm going to give you a better term. I'm going to give you a better term. Okay? okay. I call this spiritual bypassing. So people who will miss the depth of what they're trying to do in order to get to the other side faster. So uh, you'll hear a lot of people out there saying, think positively. It's like, okay, what if you're not buying into and believing the positive things that you're trying to feel? What if there's actually pain in there that has to be processed? What if there are thoughts that have to be considered? What if we have to do a little bit more deeper work instead of saying, and today I'm grateful for the fact that I have a shirt and a roof over my head and everything is great while you're sitting there sobbing right? These two things are incongruent. Right. And that is why it's it's a very well coined term in my industry, the spiritual bypassing of or toxic positivity of people doing the thumbs up and saying, I don't I shouldn't feel these things because I don't deserve to or I don't have the right to instead of exploring why the pain's there and feeling justified and worthy of holding discomfort. Um, just because you have a good life, it doesn't mean you're not worthy of experiencing anxiety or depression. Right. And that also brings it back full circle to why I work in this specific niche of people who don't fit the mold. Because they come to me and they go, "I everything's fine. I don't know what happened. And it's like, well, you've been self-gaslighting yourself for so long into being like, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. And like the robot broke <laughs> eventually. And your symptoms are now coming out and you're coming to me being like, something changed out of nowhere. I'm like, no, no, this has been a slow burn over a very long period of time and welcome to the party. Yeah. And and it's it happens with so much confidence in almost every person I work with. And I wish it didn't, but that's why like when people come to me, I just go, ha ha, okay, let's deal with it. Instead of, you know, I, I'm not gonna try and convince you of what's going on. I'll explain the science. And if you are ready to hear it and you're ready to work through it, then that is exactly where I will meet you. Um, so, yeah. Well, I like the term self-gaslighting. That to <laughs> me probably is probably the best term for that sense of avoidance avoidance therapy where you know people are basically saying to themselves oh everything's fine like you said you know i'm grateful for it. well that doesn't work if you're not actually core grateful for it. if you're just giving yourself the endorphins when they shouldn't be there in the first place all you're doing is triggering an event by avoiding what you should be looking at right so it's good to take people by the hand and say i think we need to take a walk into the dark woods just for yeah. a second so you understand <laughs> I where love you are. the dark woods <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, back to that self gaslighting thing, people don't know that they're doing it. And I think that people are, they're buying into the lie. And that's why a lot of the time people come back to me and they're like, I don't know why this isn't working. I'm journaling. I'm doing gratitude practice. I'm doing all this stuff. And I'm like, but we're not getting down underneath it. This is not a patch job. We're not here to like do a topical approach to what's happening here. We have to get underneath all this stuff and figure out what's happening at the base level. And we have to be okay and comfortable inside of our skin. And a lot of the times people ask me, how am I supposed to get there? How do I do that work? And I say, you have, you have to do it to believe it, right? You can't sit there and try and again, think your way onto the other side and pretend that you're like, okay, and now I've actualized what it's like over there. You don't know it until you do it. It brings us to the crux of the problem with a high achiever. So what I see with my patients is there's such a fear of failure if they don't know that they're going to get to the other side and how it's going to happen with all the steps and it doesn't come soon enough. Right. With my patients, or at least my patient population, I see people shy away from taking any of the steps because they can't see themselves getting to the end. And immediately the procrastination comes in, the fear of failure, the doubts, the things that people will put in place for themselves to avoid feeling the failure. So the self-sabotaging of, well, if I can't get there tomorrow, I may as well not start. And I think to myself, when I hear that kind of stuff, I'm like, 
how does anyone get there tomorrow? I've never seen a person who's ever gotten to the goals that they wanted in their life tomorrow. So if we let that get in the way of every step that we take, it's like that Wayne Gretzky quote, right? You miss 100% of the shots you don't take. And all my high achievers, they don't want to take the shot because they're so afraid and they're so vulnerable to that feeling of failure because they're so good at doing everything else that they can't handle the fracture of what happens when they go to do this thing and they suck. And that's why I build tolerance with people at first. I don't say, okay, let's look at that goal on the other side. Like it looks pretty, but it might not exist. And like what you were saying with the the grandma now lives on a beach on a condo in Florida. Um, And (laughs) when I can say to them, that's not even the challenge. The challenge for you is actually doing step one. That's the hardest part for you. So stop looking for the cake on the other side or like the rainbow pot on the other side. Let's talk, talk about jumping to get up into the rainbow first. We can't think about what's on the other side. You don't have a right to. And I'm very blunt with my patients and I say that. I'm like, why are we having all these like big conversations when you're not willing to sit with yourself in silence for 15 minutes a day? Very minimal. It's a very small ask. If I asked you to tap your head, rub your belly, hop on one leg for five minutes every single day, could you do that? And they're like, well, yeah. And I'm like, so why don't you? What's really getting in the way of you launching yourself into action if you want all those big things on the other side? And that is the vulnerability of a high achiever in a nutshell is I don't want to fail. There's too much time between now and then. There's too many steps between now and then. I don't like that. And that's why when I created my program, I don't say, okay, let's look at where you're going to be a year from now. It's module one. Let's learn that first. Module two, let's learn mindfulness and meditation. Module three, let's learn breath work and stop trying to come up with all the answers immediately, all the time, which is how high achievers solve every problem in their lives, which is I've come up with a solution immediately and everything is great. And it comes (laughs) to their own head and they're like, why can't I do it? I'm like, because you need a better blueprint. You cannot be the master of your own mind at the beginning. And I would argue that you can never be the master of your mind ever. And that's the fun part about being a human being is that we're always going to screw up and we're always going to do weird things and we're always going to self-sabotage. But if we have the skill and the tool to look at ourselves in the mirror and observe ourselves and say, okay, how can I navigate this a little bit better? What, how can I put myself in the best position possible to not do this thing that I know is going to take me down? How do I be responsible with myself, with all of the the things it just it changes the experience entirely. I'm just hearing what you're saying with the with the high achievers. I would say probably the best, and it's going to be one step at a time. And you got the people, athletes especially, that are looking at you going, "What do you mean one step?" And that must be difficult. It is challenging, but it's also me. Like that is who I am. So a lot of the times when I'm live or when I'm with my patients or I have breakthrough calls with people and I'm hearing their stories, they're like, "How are you reading my mind?" I'm like, I'm not a psychic. I swear to God, I'm literally just you. And I, I get it. And there's, there's, I was going to say there's two of me. There's 14 of me in the room right now. Um, and, and having this integrated relationship with all of those parts of myself is what I'm trying to teach to my patients. Um, I can't say to them like a kid with an ice cream cone, you know, you can't be like, you can't have this until two hours, right? The kid's going to be like, why did I, why can't I have it now, now, now? You have to explain to them why they can't have it yet. You have to tell them what the deficiencies are. And that's what I'm very clear on with my patience and peace of mind method is I'm telling them, this is why we're doing this because you don't have this skill yet. You don't have the skill, which is why you have this mindset. So let's stop trying to solve this puzzle with half of a brain and let's make you smarter first so that you can do the puzzle faster. If you resist the process, you will be sitting there stubborn, banging your head against the wall, not getting to your goals. And I can guarantee you that. But if you're willing to lean into the process and say, I am now idiot number one in the room and I'm willing to look at myself differently and change my patterns and change my mindsets and the ways that I think about things, I see massive growth. So even though I work with the world's most stubborn people, me included, okay, even though I work with them, I find that the the approach that I take allows for such a flexibility and curiosity and interest specifically for people who deal with this stuff. And I've watched some of the most hard, unsharing, closed off, tough people 
like just so mean to themselves inside their heads. I've watched them change everything and it's crazy to watch. But people are willing to do it when they are delivered the message in the way that resonates with them. And I think that that is the most challenging piece of being a doctor in mental health is that the thing I said earlier about meeting people where they're at and positive manipulation is you have to hold that space so well so that when they're hearing the message that their ears are open and receiving it instead of being like, bleh, bleh, <laughs> right? Because mo- most people hear something like me included. When I used to go to the doctor and someone would tell me to slow down because my stress and anxiety was taking me through the roof and I had to pull back on the hours I was working and pull back on the amount of things I was doing and pull back on my working out and pull. And I heard it and I was like, you are wrong. You're stupid. I don't (laughs) want to hear from you. A la la la. All I said is I want to deal with this thing and you're not listening to the problem that I'm bringing into the office. And I used to do that all the time. And then the moment that it made sense to me, I was like, oh my God, they've been saying it this whole time, but it didn't make sense until I understood it. And that is where people have to be at the right place at the right time with the right messaging, with the right practitioner, and that can change their lives. But it's not like I have the recipe to dealing with every high achiever. Like people be stubborn out there. I was stubborn. I wouldn't want to work with me. (laughs) I was challenging back then when I was totally asleep at the wheel. And I've been present with other people who are asleep at the wheel, but at least they knew I am sleeping at the wheel and I'm going to be stubborn and you're going to be in the ring with me. And when I wake up, you're still going to be here, right? Because some people do have it in them to say, something's not right. I don't like what this is. I know that I'm stubborn. I know that I can't figure this out myself. And I know I have blind spots. So I'm going to keep showing up. And then six months later, it's like, boom, they wake up and it does happen. So while it's challenging, it's also like the world's best work. I love my job. I love working with stubborn people. (laughs) So do you have like at the very beginning, the very intro, do you have some kind of an analytics tool in your head, in your process that defines whether a person is in the right mindset to move forward? Yes. So that's literally every person that starts peace of mind. method. (laughs) (laughs) Come on. There must be somebody who comes to you and says, I know I got a problem and I really need to deal with it. They do. I don't know what I got to do. They mo- Okay, most people who sign up to work with me know that they have an issue. They don't know how it's going to get solved or where we're going to go with it or how these tools work or what's going to happen along the way, but they're willing to try. Right. The people who are very close-minded, what I try and do in conversations with them is get them to see how their own thoughts are leading them back to the same place. And usually someone with who's a high achiever usually has higher intellect and they do have the capability of at least being walked through it once twice three times being like oh i am doing this like i am in charge i'm now able to see in the mirror so i would say as an analogy what i do is instead of letting them go on their tirade (laughs) i take their shoulders and i step them in front of the mirror and i just say tell me what you see tell me what you think the problem is Tell me how you think that you're landing yourself there. And when you turn the narrative back on someone else and they have to look in, they actually give the answers and they know. And then once it's out in the ethers and they've said it to me, then I go, okay, so what would you like to do about it? You have two options. You either stay the same as you are. Nothing changes. If nothing changes, nothing changes. That is another famous quote of mine. Yes, it is. I've got it written right here. If nothing changes, nothing changes. (laughs) If that's where you want to be, fine. And you will have to sit in your shit of knowing that you made no changes and that that is the reason why you are still in your suffering. And that's fine. When you come out of that in six months and you go, wow, I banged my head on the wall enough. You want to come back? Great. Some other people hear that and they go, oh, I don't want that. I don't want to stay where I am. Staying where I am is worse. It's like the devil you know versus the devil you don't. People are like, I don't like the devil I know either. I'd rather know the devil I don't. And it just depends on where someone is at along their contemplative journey of are you ready and willing to do this deeper work or not? And I do tell my patients before we ever start working together, I say, you have to hold yourself accountable. I can't drive 12 hours to wherever you live to come drag you. I'm not taking a plane to come get you to do what you need to do. Like this has to be a self journey that you are committing to in yourself and showing up for me. As much as you show up to me, I'm going to show back up for you and I'm going to help you get there. But if you are not going to be willing to do the work, how could I possibly help at all? And 
I think that people forget that a bit when they're doing the mental health stuff and they're going to see the therapist and they're, they're consistently bringing their problems and they're leaning on that person to help them find the answers. And I always say we have to lean away from that model because you have to show agency in your life. You have to be willing to do things to get somewhere different. And I'm so strict on it <laughs> in my program. That's why I say like someone will come to me and be like, oh, well, I'm still experiencing this. And I go, what module are you in? They'll be like, well, I'm stuck in module two. And I'm like, well, get to module four. And then we can have a very good conversation about where we think things are going wrong. Because I can't create change by talking to you. I'm not a magician. I am not a witch. All I can do is see the progress that you're making and listen to the obstacles that you're having and help you navigate around it. And I'm not, I, I'm not magical. I lead with this all the time. Didn't do anything magical for myself except for committed to doing something and, you know, suffering through it. And then my patients do the same thing. Every single person who I've seen make epic life changes who are very committed to the goal that they had and continuing to show up for themselves even when they failed, even when they sat there and sobbed to me and said, this isn't working. And I was like, okay, I know where you are right now, but come back to me in three weeks and tell me if you're still sobbing there saying this isn't working. Because if it's different in three weeks or if it's different in two days than it is now, then what is now is just temporary. And you're supposed to go through that. And the beautiful analogy that I give people about this always has to do with animals. I love animal analogies because we are part animal in our brains. And I said this the other night in a live I did about health anxiety. And I said to everyone, just like a caterpillar has to rifle in its cocoon to become a butterfly, you have to do the same thing. We can't cut the cocoon open and have that thing become a butterfly because it won't live. It won't survive. The same way that you can't take a turtle from its nest. And if he's like, crawling the wrong way and struggling and you're like, oh no, I need to save the baby turtle. And you toss it into the water. It dies on arrival because it has to have the struggle to get to where it's going in order for it to be functioning as the specimen that it is. And that is something I will never take away from my patients. I do not feel uncomfortable in other people's suffering. I don't try and fix. I don't try and change the ways that are, you know, the ways people think in the moment and how things are going from a evolutionary standpoint because they have to rifle with themselves to become the next version of themselves on the other side. And I think that a lot of people go to therapy to get that momentary help. Be like, I'm suffering. I need to help. I need to think through this. And sometimes it has to happen and I'm okay watching that. And it's so masochistic, but you know what? Like it, my patients come back to me after and they go, thank you. And I'm like, you're welcome. <laughs> and, and we have a better relationship for it. Instead of me putting my sticky fingers and everything. Yeah. Um, so do you basically communicate it as end states? Do you say, you know, you're going to get better or do you envision it? Do you explain it as this is always a journey? I actually never use the word better. I use the word different. Good. And I'm very particular about this word because most people come to me saying, I just want to feel better. And I said, I don't know what better means but I know what different means. And a lot of people also say to me, I just want to be like I used to be. And I go, no, 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 no. We don't want to try getting back to what you used to be because how you used to be is how you got to where you are right now. Yeah. So we need to become something different than we were <laughs> before. And I just, I love that word because it creates cur curiosity and creativity and flexibility in someone's brain where they're like, I don't know what that next phase is. I think people have this envisionment of what better is. They're like, well, I'm going to have this and this and this and this. And they, <laughs> they make their fantasy draft of what life is going to look like instead sure. of saying, I don't know what's on the other side, but it's going to feel different than where you are right now. And I'm also very big on saying to my patients, we're not going to never have a lack of anxiety and depression. If you're coming to me with a diagnosis I'm not going to be able to take away your anxiety or take away your depression. You're going to still be Jenna with anxiety and depression with a ton of more skills on the other side of this and having a very different relationship with it. And I want people to understand that, that they're not trying to change who they are and we're not trying to remove things from ourselves. We're trying to be with ourselves differently so that we can experience something different. Um, so yeah, the word better I don't know why it gives me such a yucky feeling. 
<laughs> I think it because it ties into that perfectionist mindset. I also don't use the word healed. I use the word healing <laughs> because it is a process. And <laughs> I'm so sorry to your editor who's going to have to block this out again. Life is going to keep throwing shit your way. Oh, no matter who you one. are. It's fine. Okay. <laughs> no matter who you are. If you have anxiety, depression, any mental health diagnosis, if you're an average Joe off the street, <laughs> you, life is going to throw shit your way. Mm -hmm. And that is why I tell my my patients, we need to learn that this is about riding a wave, the wave of life. It is not better. It is not from broken to fixed. It's not from you know unhealed to healed and now everything is great. You can go through a mental health journey and end up on the other side. And six months later, a life crisis could happen and it could impact your mental health so dramatically. But the way you interface with it, that second round is different. Yep. And that's what I started noticing with myself in my mental health is my anxiety and depression was so unbelievably impacted by the external sources and the confounding variables of my life. And I was like, this is going to keep happening, obviously. I don't think that I'm going to come up with a recipe for changing how life works. However, what I can do is change how well I ride the wave. So when I say to my patients in the program, I'm like, I'm going to make you a surfer. We're going to get very good at surfing these waves. Whether there's going to be high highs or low lows, you're still going to be on the wave. You're not going to be crashing underneath the tide telling you that your life is over when there are moderate inconveniences that we all do have to experience and go through. And that is the, it's a universal experience for people who have anxiety and depression is they don't know how to navigate the changes of life as simply as those who don't struggle with that. We're just so much more emotionally invested in ourselves and how we allow things impact and affect us. And we have to get stronger and more tolerant about how we are integrating with those things as they get thrown at us. And it, we we just need to build tools to get there. Yeah. Because again, life goes on. You things just popped into my head. Number one, the quote from the movie, The Horrors. Okay, but also... <laughs> okay. I used to say this a long time ago when I was in clinic because I had so many patients all the time yearning and churning the same stuff um, before I was working online. And I used to say, such is life. Someone would come to me with a statement as if it was so absolute and so complete and so final and so bad. And I would go, such is life. We continue. Right. It, we, we have to continue. Like, again, you have two choices. And it's so it's so bad for me to say, but I will say it because I'm someone who would say something like this. <laughs> but I would say to my patients, I'd say, well, you have the choice to not continue on. If that's the choice that you make, like, by all means, make it. I'm not telling you to do that. But if, if that's how you feel and you can't handle the horrors of life and you can't navigate them. OK, that's OK. But still, you're in my office every week. So you have kept on keeping on and knowing that, that the days are going to continue and they're going to keep following forward. Why don't we put a plan in place to make this more um, tolerable? Um, and people do hear that and they go, oh, yeah, I'm legitimately not making the best of my time here. Um, I am falling into the same patterns and doing the same things and saying the same things and repeating the same narrative. It's not helpful. Um, especially when I can just go, Boop, let's create a change. And they're like, I didn't think that was possible. And it's like, yeah, because you keep staring at the problem in the room with such focus, instead of turning your eyes somewhere else and going, oh, if I put some work in over there, that changes my experience over here, which is your wax on wax off example of if you just do something a little bit differently over here, you might see the butterfly effect coming through over here. And well, I think people- <laughs> <laughs> people need to they need to see it though and that's why for me mental health it's such a i'll believe it when i see it situation and i i try and push people into action because they're like well what am i going to expect and i'm like I literally can't tell you <laughs> what to expect i need you to do the thing and then you tell me what you experience if you don't want that if you don't want the experience and the growth please be on your way. But if you are interested in investing in yourself and doing that, and you're curious about the potential for change and different, just do it. Very simple. Just do something. Start small, keep building. Start small, keep building. Have you recognized or seen any 
and I'll put the quotes around it, butterfly effect events on some of the processes that you introduce where it's something so moderately tangible, but in an area that doesn't speak to what the person came to you with. And then all yes. of a sudden you see quickly this this small event created this huge event way over here that I didn't see the correlation until it happened. Yeah. So I'm going to use one of my patients as an example because I love this one because it caught me off guard too. Um, and she was a patient that came into me with high anxiety, needed lots of reassurance, um, health anxiety, OCD, all these things going on. Um, but she really wanted to work on the health anxiety piece. So I said, great, we're going to start peace of mind method. We're going to do our appointments. We're going to stick with the tools. And I don't want you to look at anything. I just want you to put your head down and I want you to do the things. You're going to start with module one, learn about the nervous system. You're going to do your mindfulness. You're going to do your meditation. You're going to do your breath work. We're going to get your sleep better optimized. We're going to eat properly. We're going to start practicing yoga. And we started doing all these things. And she came back to me after like six to eight weeks. And it was our second an appointment together. And she said, the weirdest thing happened, Jenna. And I went, what is it? <laughs> and she said, I went in an elevator and I sat there and went, K, like, yeah. like people do, we go into elevators to climb <laughs> floors. Right. Um, and she was like, I haven't been able to go in to an elevator in 10 plus years. She's like, every building I've ever been in, I've had to walk up the stairs. I can't be in an elevator. I have such a fear of elevators. If I'm going to be in any enclosed space, I have to have water and a snack just in case I get stuck in there for 12 hours. And it was such a phobia of hers that I had no idea about. And she came to me saying, I went in an elevator and I then answered with K. And she said, you don't understand. It was so weird. I walked into the building and instead of going to the stairs, I just walked up to the elevator like a normal person. And then when I was in it, she went, holy shit, I'm in an elevator. And it was it was such a moment for her because she was like, whoa, I wasn't trying to work on that at all. Yeah. I didn't have any fears that I was like. I need to go for mental health support so that I could go in elevators. Like she wasn't thinking that she was right. like, I have OCD. I, it takes four hours out of my day. I have to unplug and plug things in six times and lock the door seven times. And I can't go to bed without checking every single clock in my house. It was taking up hours of her life. And that's where she was trying to do the work. And we were trying to regulate her nervous system. So those symptoms happen less and that the anxiety happened less and that the health anxiety was less and the impact somewhere so random where she was like, oh my God, this stuff is working because she went in an elevator. And yeah. it's just such an example to give everyone that if you keep staring at the stink in the room, sometimes you miss the benefit of yeah. doing everything else. And like the, I had a patient the other night on my live about health anxiety and she came to me saying, I am unfixable. I'm the worst patient you'll ever meet. You will never be able to fix me. Um, but she was so willing to come to every appointment every single week and showing up and doing the program. And it was amazing. But she's like, you won't be able to fix me. Um, and she was at rock bottom, like rock, rock, rock bottom. And six months later, she was like, I don't know what's happening. I now in a healthy relationship and I have a job and all these things are happening for me. And I am able to go into public places and I haven't been to the hospital in six months. And people start reporting stuff. But I think the hardest part for mental health is that people don't realize their growth. So when she's in it, she's like, I don't know if anything's really changed. Um, but you know, then there's this, 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 this. You're like, oh, okay, so lots has changed when you started working on yourself. Amazing. Um, I had a patient that just started a peace of mind method two months ago, and she started with me. She said, I'm going to the hospital every single week. And I'm spending an absurd amount of money on this. She's like, this is not, this is not helpful. Like I have health anxiety. I have I, nothing is ever feeling okay inside my body. And I don't know where this is coming from. Okay. <laughs> she comes to her second follow-up appointment and she says to me, I don't think anything's changed. I'm still so anxious. And I said, oh, that's great. When was the last time you've been to the hospital? She said, oh, well, I haven't been since we started working together. And I was like, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So nothing's changed. Right. That's good. So I think when people are in it, they they struggle to see their growth. And that's why I love using clinical skills to say, okay, let's check your GAD7. Let's do your PHQ9. Let's do your perceived stress scale. Let's do all these numbers 12 weeks apart so that we can see the difference of your perception. Because as you grow with your perception, your perception changes. 
right? And that is the struggle with mental health is, especially with my high achievers, is this feeling of never good enough comes with them mm-hmm. along along for the journey. Yeah. And then we're on this hedonic staircase of when is it ever good enough? When are we going to feel good? When does healed come? When does all this stuff that everyone else is talking about happen when you're in it and you're missing it? So it's that's why I always tell people do third party, have someone else like a spouse or a friend or a family member or a doctor, have someone give their review to you about your growth, because you can't always trust yourself when you're in it. We just aren't the right observers. Has anyone listening now is not live. You're going to post this after. But have you ever had a journal? And like you wrote stuff in it. Yeah. Yes. Have you ever looked back at it a year later and you're like, oh my God. Okay. <laughs> I've had that experience so many times where I'm like, who's that person? What was, what were they going through? I Oh my God. <laughs> and I think most people, if they read back on their stuff, they'd be like, oh my goodness, there was really something going on there. And it's so important to recognize in that moment that you are not a trustworthy example of how far you've come and how far you've grown by being in here. We need the objective measures of what's going on to see our growth. Um, And the butterfly effect of life is a great way to see that. How are your relationships going? How has your energy been? How is your sleep? How is your social life? How is work? Like you have to look at these things and say, have I gotten my shit together and things are panning out for me? Or am I still in that dark hole that I was when I first started looking at myself and coming down on myself for these things? So that's where I, I think they may, they may still have somehow layered on a dark hole uh, filter, even though yes. things have gone better. And as you said, having a third party say, uh, what dark hole? You've been really <laughs> amazing, really happy. You've been spontaneous. You've been doing all. Yeah, but, you know, I've got this. And how do you eliminate that voice? How do you is that like part seven? We're getting rid of the guy in your head that keeps telling you there's a dark hole sitting here. Yeah. So that's <laughs> called negative lens bias. Okay. And it's very, very common in people who have anxiety and depression. Um, So what I work on with my patients is delineating our cognitive distortions so that we know the difference between what's us and what's our perception and what is a symptom. Because negative lens bias is a symptom. And if that's present, we have to be able to filter through our own bullshit and say, what are the facts here? Um, Another famous quote of mine is facts over feelings. Facts are facts. And here comes the bleep for your editor. (laughs) Facts are facts. Feelings are fucked. And we can't always look at our feelings and be like, well, that's how I feel. So that's how this is. And I'm sure you've heard people out there in the world being like, your thoughts are not who you are. Your thoughts are just thoughts. Um, And we have to be able to separate the two. And I think that that takes more longevity. You know, you get more responsible with yourself when you figure out, okay, these are my symptoms. That's my go-to. I call it my dark and twisty. When I'm in dark and twisty, I know when she's there. And I'm like, "Hmm, I'm not going to be making decisions from this place right now because that is my negative lens bias with the cloud over the whole situation and me having my input on the situation instead of saying, well, how do I really feel inside? Because that is a projection of our protection. The way that we have that fog over us and say, well, nothing's good and never going to be better and blah, blah, blah. We get stuck in those cognitive distortions. So later on in my program, when I know people are more responsible with all the things happening in here, that's when I say, let's figure out what your distortions are. Let's figure out what your core beliefs are um, and see how we can organize those on pretty shelves and say, ooh, that's that one coming out to play right now. That's not actually who I am. That's that voice talking right now. We don't actually believe that voice. That one comes in when I'm feeling threatened. Um, So we try and organize the parts a bit better. And I think that everyone can benefit from doing that so that you know what reality really is. And I think that that's the trickiest part about mental health is our reality gets distorted. And we buy into it because we have no other reality in our brain. We only have us. (laughs) So we're just trying to swim through this muddy water being like, how I feel is what it is. So I can't change that. It's like, yeah, you can. <laughs> when you do the work, you you can change that. Um, and people do get it. That's, that's the thing about every single person that I've ever worked with very closely is that these concepts become, they become Bible to people. It's like, 
they understand it so well. They understand how it relates body and mind in their nervous system. They understand why symptoms are happening. They understand what they need to put in place for these things not to happen. They understand when to listen to their intuition and when that's not intuition at all. And most people get confused between the two things. Um, and that's, I just see people getting so smart with themselves. Um, and it's because I force them to look within. I don't go, okay, welcome to my lecture. Here are the answers. Let me tell you, everyone take notes. It's no, no, no. I'll say a few things that are knowledgeable, but you can only learn these things when you do them. When you start sitting with your shit, then you will start to be able to download this information in your brain. Right. right? And that's why I try to stray people away from self-help books. You can read all the self-help books you want in the world and never make a change and then complain and say, I've been working on my mental health for 10 years. It's like, how? By listening to podcasts and by reading books and by passive learning and by leaving motivational quotes on your wall? Mm -hmm. You got to do something. So that's where I try and like bring the, the mobility to a situation and say, okay, we're going to change things up. It's going to be different. It's not going to be better. It's going to be different. And you're launching into action so that all these things can change. Excellent. Um, the one last thing on my mind about mental health is I know there is a correlation between mental health and physical health. So the question I guess to you would be, do you start when working with somebody establishing whether they are at a baseline requirement where their body, their brain is getting what it needs to be healthy? And, you know, I know that's very, very clinical and understanding their serotonin levels. I'm sure you're not taking blood work from them and that sort of thing, but at least. Oh, no, I get blood work. Oh, really? People, people give me their blood work all the time. Um, and I love looking at nutrient deficiencies because there's a lot of things that doctors miss. Yeah. Um, I think that a lot of people think that because it says it's in the reference range, that it means that they are healthy, which right. I see a lot of the time that that's not the case. I see a lot of people with really low iron levels yes. that are in range, but so unbelievably tanked <laughs> that I see the blood work and I go, ah, no wonder you're having heart palpitations and you feel tired all the time and you're getting dizzy and you can't sleep very well and you're waking up with anxiety at 5 a.m. Yeah. It's right here, right? Yeah. But a doctor sees a, a 10, right? And it's in the reference range from eight to whatever it's going to. And they're like, oh, you're good. Yeah, you're um, good. <laughs> so I do, I do see people's blood work often. Oh, um, and I'm looking at usually vitamin nutrient deficiencies. Mm -hmm. um, I'm obviously looking at CBCs, um, which is just your regular differentials to show us what's happening at the base blood level. Right. Um, and then we're going to look at other things like blood sugar and hormones and other stuff that can be contributing to stuff. And then also the fact that people sometimes miss diagnoses all the time. Um, or doctors aren't testing for certain things that they don't think is relevant to the case. Right. Um, and I think that that happens a lot at the family doctor because they don't want to <laughs> come up with a whole laundry list of things that they shouldn't be testing for. And, you know, I see that and I go, OK, well, I'll do it. I can, I'll, let's just test it. Yeah. Um, and it's just I need more information sometimes. Um, but then there's also on the other side of the spectrum, we need to not over test. We need to not be going into all these crazy like new age things and always testing our poo and checking for mold. And do people, people do a lot of things uh, to explain things that they're experiencing in the body. Right. Um, but, but to keep this on topic to what you were talking about with knowing if someone's at baseline health mm -hmm. is this is how I designed the program the way I did. I need to make sure that people are practicing the basics, the mindfulness, the meditation, the breath work at the beginning, because everyone comes on, comes into me saying, I need these symptoms to be gone as fast as humanly possible. <laughs> and, I, and I need some things out of, out of, you know, the way right, right. away. Sure. And I honor that. So that's why I created it in the way that I did at the beginning to say, okay, here's tools first for when you're freaking out and how we're going to regulate this. And then after we get through that phase, I do sleep optimization right away because if someone's not sleeping, mm. we cannot impact their mental health. So that's something that I'm very adamant about from an athlete perspective. Their recovery is usually so bad. Um, so athletes overtrain. Yep. They don't sleep well and then they don't recover. And then we end up with total nervous system dysregulation and they're complaining about all sorts of things, pain in the body, anxiety symptoms, not sleeping good. Like they've got it all. GI stuff, headaches, 
it's all across the board. Yeah. And I say first, okay, let's do the sleep stuff because we have to make sure we're functioning there. Then I do nutrition with people. I make sure that we are not missing blatant things in our diet. And again, you brought up athletes. Let's put most human beings who have ever yo-yo dieted yes. in their life. We got nutrition deficiencies up our wazoos. We have ways of thinking about food that is totally pathological. Um, people have a category of healthy and unhealthy foods. I don't believe in that. Yeah. I think that there is a balance to strike between all of these things. Mm -hmm. So when I'm working on nutrition with people, I try and change the framework of well, how do we eat for our brains? Do we have enough fat in our diet? Do we have enough protein in our diet? Do we have enough carbohydrates in our diet? People look at carbs like they are the monsters. Yeah. Carbohydrates are what give us the building blocks for neurotransmitters. So yeah. we cannot not have carbohydrates. Um, and I think that people don't understand the fulsome science of it and they just see as healthy or not healthy. Yep. And I try and bring a new way of eating into people's lives so they understand how to eat for their brain. Um, and then I do a huge module on exercise and movement. How do we exercise depending on the state of our nervous system? What symptoms are you having? Do we need to pull back? Do we have to lean in? Do we have to balance this a little bit better? What happens when I pull that away from you, right? How do you react or respond to that? Do you know how to find recovery? Do you know how to chill? Do you know how to exercise for the state that your body is in in that moment? Or are you just pushing, 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 pushing? right? Like people who have a gym routine, they're like, I go five days a week. I'm like, <laughs> okay. Um, does it matter how you sleep? Does it matter what you've eaten that day? Do you just go five days a week? Or like, are you looking at the details that go into that? What if when you wake up and you're not feeling 80% enough to do the thing that you want to do, do you still force yourself to work out? So there's all these small little things that I look at so that I can make sure I understand what state someone's nervous system is in before I make my treatment protocols for that specific person. Um, and you can tell by screening these kind of questions, who's dealing with what shticks. And that's the, it, it's so good. Cause when I say like, we're gonna clean up, I want you to imagine that someone's life with a mental health condition is a lumpy carpet. And we're going underneath there and we're sweeping everything out. And I don't want anyone to forget about the lump in the back corner, just cause it's underneath the couch. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And I like to do this cleaning up job so that I can make sure that people aren't subconsciously or at least hiding from me and evading things that are causing a lot of stress in their lives. Does the way that they see themselves in the mirror, does that cause a lot of cortisol to flood through their body? Is that what this is driven from? Is there someone who doesn't feel comfortable feeling emotions? Is that where that need to do that is driven from? And it gives me more of like, I get to be subliminal and I'm being sneaky when I do it. They don't know what I'm looking for, but I get to ask these, these questions and really weed out what someone is dealing with and how those smaller stressors or maybe even really big hidden stressors are impacting them at the nervous system level. So that when I go to treat, I know exactly what I'm dealing with. Right. Yeah. So that my program, I describe it as like, you know, the storybooks as a kid where you would pick one way, pick that way. Yes. And then you get to continue on the story. Um, that is how I designed the way I work with people, um, because I still want people to have their own journey and I want people to do it by themselves, too. Like, I don't want to again, sorry for the whatever's going to come out of my mouth right now, but I don't want someone to have to ask me to wipe their ass. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Like yeah. people need to have agency within themselves and I want them to have that. So I say, if this is you, this is what I want you to lean toward. If this is you, I want you to go in that direction. And everyone who has mental health stuff going on, it's unique, but it's also very similar. And I think that we, there's no such thing as a one size fits all. You have to be able to listen to yourself. So that's where I'm putting most of the tools. I just hit my mic. I'm sorry. I'm trying to put most of the tools into someone becoming more self-aware of what is it that, that my body is saying? How do I get closer to that communication? And how do I learn what's right for me? Um, and I can provide some ideas along the way. But you do have to make it your own. Like, I don't tell everyone in my program, you must meditate every single day for half an hour at this time. And then you must do this. And then we have to go on a hike on this mountain. And then you have to travel all the way to Nepal to learn from the Buddhist monks. Like, I don't do that. I'm very, we all have busy lives and we're all doing shit. And we have to figure this out as we go and make it work with our lives because it's your life plan. And it has to make sense to you. It has to resonate with you. If you're doing breath work and you're, 
Um, you're only working with one person who says, let's use Wim Hof as, as an example, where you have to do the breath work like that. It has to be holotropic all the time. And we do it for an hour a day until you hallucinate, right? Someone with anxiety might do that. And they may be like, this is the worst thing I've ever done. And I'm having a panic attack. Um, and someone else might be like, this is so transformational. This is, this changed my life. Okay. It's amazing. Good. It worked for you. Too bad. It didn't work for you. The way that I work with my patients is not, if you don't do it my way, that's the highway. It's let's figure this out together and find something that really works for what it is that you're going through. And let's do modifications along the way if we need to, plus the individualized care. When people are in my appointments, I have no choice but to do exactly what it is that they're bringing to me. Um, but when they're not inside my sphere of my appointment, when they're by themselves, I give options. Kind of like letting a kid choose. Would you like broccoli, Brussels sprouts, or green beans? You don't say to your kid, what vegetable would you like for dinner? They're going to be like, smiley fries, right? They don't, they want the the options. So that's how I navigate the human brain is we are animals and we are children. And we have to be given some flexibility to feel that we have the power to make our own decisions, but we need guidance. And that's what yep. the program is, is it's very guided, but you get to build your own path as you go through it. Anyways, Dr. Jenna, it has been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. I'd love to do this again. So hopefully we can engage you again. Yeah. Get you back on the show. That would be really, really good. And if anybody in my audience, the people that have been listening to us, if they want to reach out, is there a way that they can reach you? Is there any places that they can see you and start to get sort of that connectivity where they say, yep, you know what? She can help me. Yeah. So if you are present on Instagram, um, my uh, handle is at dr.jenna.t. So that, that is the easiest place to reach me. I am always on there, always engaging with my patients and my followers online. Um, I also have a private Facebook community called Real Life with Anxiety and Depression. So I can send you the link to that if you want to post it with the video or wherever this is going on, if someone okay. wants that. Yep. Um, and I can give everyone the opportunity who does watch this to book a breakthrough call with me if they want to. So if they have anxiety and depression and they feel that they are stuck in the same boat, they probably have some of that high achiever mentality um, that they can reach out to me and then we can have a call and see if peace of mind method is going to be helpful for them because the program is not for everyone, as we talked about before, but it is for a lot of the people who are in this niche. Um, so if anyone's interested in that, I'm more than willing to have a conversation with them so they can learn more about it. Fantastic. So thank you again very, very much. You're welcome. Uh, I've enjoyed this. And as I said, I hope we can do this again soon. We will. Right. <laughs> I'll guarantee it. All right. All right. Psychic. <laughs> He's doing that. All right. Yes, we'll we, chat will. Soon. we will. All right. <laughs> we will. Positive manipulation. <laughs> All right. Bye for now, John. All right. Ciao.